My name is William Spriggs, Director of Economic and Cooperative Development at BDIC, Bermuda Economic Development Corporation. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, or let me keep the mic up. Yeah, that's a bit better, Armani. Thank you. All right. So, Christina, you want to have a, have a seat for a minute? We're going to do all sorts of wonderful things to introduce you in a sec, yeah? Okay. So we're going to start on time, for those of you who are on time, about eight minutes past or so. We've got a full hour and a half, two hours for you. We're going to try to keep it moving. Lots to talk about. Um, just a few housekeeping pieces. I'm joined by the BDIC team this evening. We've got Denise Mapp on the video machine over here. Yeah, so thank you, Denise, for all your wonderful extra mile service. So Denise um, is a, also a graphic designer and she laid out the whole booklet that you have here in front of you. And she's the administrative assistant here at BDIC, just joined the organization. So thank you, Denise, for all the glue that you've provided um, to make this evening possible for us. Also got Jamila Lodge, our director of communication and development. <laughs> She's got a new title, Ease Me Up, Ease Me Up, yeah? Got to take a look at it. Yeah, so Jamila, thank you so much for joining us and whatnot, and, and certainly all your help um, this evening as well. So while I'm on the thank yous, um, we've got Damon at the back on our AV Tech there. Thank you, Damon. Also, Star Time, Star Time Spanish Town, Eugene Dean with the screen. We've got the speakers and whatnot. We always like to be able to kind of bring it first class to you. No slackness on the video and the audio, okay? Um, also, we've got, just to be able to acknowledge our, one of our board members, we've got Mr. Stephen Conway right there to my right. Thank you, Stephen, for coming out. Um, also with the Estates Department and the Acting Surveyor there. Uh, so thank you again, Steve. Um, we're gonna kinda just run it. Um, uh, Christina, who will be introduced by Jamila in just a few minutes. Um, her presentation, uh, feel free to be able to ask questions at any time during the presentation, or you can note them and save them to the end. Uh, we want to make sure that all your questions, all your thoughts are fully explored, especially because we're in this new cooperative development space. So we started this late last year. For those of you, some of you that um, have um, joined us last November the 9th at St. Paul's Centennial, um, you know, we had our first cooperative development seminar with Dr. Julian Manley, and then we followed him up um, just quickly after on December 4th and 5th. We brought in the One Worker, One Vote team, and then just recently, March the 30th, with Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. And I believe we have one or two that have been to all of our events. Can I see a hand? Can I see a hand? All of our cooperative events? Did you miss one? Yeah, Jonathan? Yeah? Thank you so much. Okay, so you've been following the work following the story, what is a cooperative, types of cooperative, it's a cooperative for me, all sorts of burning questions, shares, interests, memberships, and certainly we're gonna to touch on all that in just a few minutes. Um, just to finish up, we've all, we also have uh, Calvin, who's taking some pictures for us this evening, thank you so much, Calvin. Uh, if you can get some video for us as well, and what Denise doesn't capture. Good to see you, Fanon coming out as well. So I did mention to um, the economic thinkers here right in front of me to say, hey, you know, um, if you want to be able to give us a call, we're happy to meet with you personally, individual, individually with your small group to say, hey, you know, we've got some ideas. Um, and thanks for that seminar that we came to the other night, but here's where we want to go. Here are our, our, our ideas. How can you help? And we'll be happy to be able to kind of one-on-one, one-on-four-five, -on -one, one -on whoever you bring to the table to be able to consult and speak to you directly about your goals, your interests, your vision, your mission. We're not going to get into now our BDIC microloan. We have a few types of microloan. Um, a sports club microloan for $25,000 from us to you, your sports club. And so we had a sports club seminar last night. Christine, Christina came in on Sunday. Uh, thank you for talking to our board, our team, on Monday afternoon, the lunch meeting. Uh, and we followed up last night just to be able to speak to sports clubs um, individually at our offices over at Sophia House in our training room, and certainly here tonight. And you're going tomorrow. So hopefully we haven't worked you too hard. Yeah? 
Okay, but um, so our sports club microloan, we have a general microloan in which we can loan you businesses up to twenty thousand dollars, and we're looking at possibly increasing it to fifty thousand. Us to you, no bank. Yeah, and then we also have a debt consolidation loan for any past debts over the last three, four years. You know, sometimes we get behind and whatnot, and so we have a loan purposefully for that for you to be able to wrap up those past debts. Us to you directly, twenty thousand dollars. Of course, our loan guarantee is going strong. We can guarantee up to $200,000. That's our maximum guarantee, or 65% of your bank loan, but still a maximum of 200. That works with any of the island's three banks, HSBC, Clarion, and Butterfield. And we also, of course, our vendor markets, economic empowerment zone. If you're looking at purchasing any property, any building, doing any significant renovations within the economic empowerment zone, Somerset, North Hamilton, and St. George's, we can advocate, champion, sort of give some elbows to the bank to be able to get you the best discounted interest rate if you are doing anything significant within any one of those three economic empowerment zones. Yep, all righty, good stuff. So Stephen, I'm gonna give you a park for a minute, yeah, right there. And I think that's it for me and Jamila. You can come to the front to introduce our most honorable guest presenter this evening. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our special guest um, to share with you some information on what's required to finance a co-op, because you need the money in order to get it done. So Christina Jennings is the Executive Director of Shared Capital Cooperative in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Christina has worked for 20 years in the community development finance and microfinance in the U.S. and internationally. Since 2008, she has been Executive Director of Shared Capital Cooperative, a National Community Development Financial Institution, or CDFI, loan fund that works to build a democratic economy by investing in cooperative businesses and housing. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Christina. Can you hear me? Let's see if this works. Okay, terrific. So it is really a pleasure for me to be here. I feel really honored to be with you tonight um, and to be able to talk about the work we're doing and talk some about how that might relate to the work you're doing here in, in Bermuda. So um, really my pleasure to be here. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Vidic uh, for bringing me, uh, bringing me here. And I look forward to returning uh, for vacation at some point because I'm only getting a chance to glimpse at your beautiful island. Um, so terrific, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of things. I am gonna talk about how to finance cooperatives, as promised. I'm gonna start, though, with a little bit of information about our organization, as it, and in part, it's an example of a cooperative and a way to finance cooperatives, so I wanna share that with you. I also wanna talk a little bit, you hear okay? I, I wanna talk a little bit about cooperatives in general for folks who may not have been at some of the past sessions, and then we'll, we'll get into some finance and examples and and uh, make sure we get lots of time for your questions. As William said, I'm happy to have you uh, interrupt me with questions. If there's, uh, if there's a term that I'm using that is, uh, or an acronym or something that I'm using that doesn't make sense to you, this context, please let me know and, and, and let me clarify it so we can, um, we can make the most of our time together. Um, and if you have other questions or comments as we go, um, that is welcome. So let me just share with you a little bit about, um, about me, and then I'll share a little bit more about our organization. So I came to Shared Capital, as Jamila said, uh, about 10 years ago. I had worked for a little over, uh, for about 12 years, with, with uh, community loan funds in the United States that made microloans, similar to some of the work that BDIC does, and um, also worked uh, in Central America uh, with uh, microloan organizations. I worked both on the, on the lending side and also on a lot of time on the, on the time raising the money that could be available for loans. Uh, and so um, it was interesting when the opportunity came to come to this organization, um, it really, the question for me was, why co-ops? And I think that's the question. I'd heard about co-ops, I thought they were a good thing, but why was I going to work with co-ops? And I think some of what we'll talk about tonight is what motivated me and what, I think it took me about six months into my job before I realized that co-ops were really where I wanted to be spending my time and why I've become very passionate about co-ops. 
Um, so, so our mission as an organization, uh, Shared Capital Cooperative, uh, it seeks to make a more equitable and more just economy. And we do that, we believe that the more co-ops that there are, that the more, and the more successful they are as businesses, uh, that the more just economy we can have. And so that is, and that people will have the experience of uh, an opportunity to exercise democratic practices at the grassroots level in their communities. So we invest by making loans to cooperatives, uh, cooperatives of all types. And I'll talk more about some of the different types of cooperatives a little bit later, um, but we work with any type of cooperative organization. We make loans from micro loans of $5,000 up to uh, loans of, uh, our largest loan is about $650,000. Uh, and we put that money together with banks or credit unions often, and that way we can, we can even do multi-million dollar projects for cooperatives. And so it's a huge range that we're working with from very small groups that just need a, a few thousand dollars to get started up to groups that are doing major real estate redevelopment projects for their cooperatives and everything in between. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of fun, a lot of variety. Um, and our organization, I, I'd like to share a little bit about how we got started because it's, it's um, I think we, we do a good job of remembering our history. Um, sometimes we've been around for 40 years and in 40 years you can forget your history a little bit, but our organization was actually founded by a small group of cooperatives. So there were um, a growing number of small grocery store cooperatives back in, my, in where, where I live, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, in, in the 1970s, they started being more of them and they were growing, but they couldn't get bank financing. The banks really didn't understand the cooperative model. Um, and in fact, um, one, of the, one of the things that led to our founding was that one of the co-ops went to a bank to apply for a loan. They needed some new refrigeration equipment. They needed to get some new shelves. These co-ops were pretty small. And it's amazing that the bank didn't laugh at them or send them away. Actually, the bank said, yes, we'll give you a loan. And they were thrilled until the bank said, and we just need all of your owners to sign. Well, the co-op had hundreds of owners at the time. And the owners were not going to personally guarantee this loan. And they were not going to all sign on this loan. So um, in fact, even where there was a bank, uh, at the time there were more community banks than there are today in our, in our country. There are quite few today. Uh, even at that time, even with a willing bank, um, the co-op still had a hard time getting, getting financing. So they started meeting in uh, the, back, uh, the back offices of one of, the, of one co-op in town and started planning. And what they decided to do was form their own fund. And so ultimately, five different cooperatives um, pooled their money together. They put together $4,500 and created a loan fund. Uh, and it probably was as ridiculous then as it sounds today, but it worked. <laughs> so they were able to lend the money uh, to each other over the next several years. They'd buy new shelves, new refrigerated equipment, and little by little they built up this fund. So that today we're a $13 million fund and we have 250 members um, in 35 states. So we, work, we actually work nationally, we haven't, we haven't made it to all the states yet, but we work, uh, we work any place there are cooperatives who want to join. And, um, and they are all different types of cooperatives and they put money into our fund um, and borrow from our fund and um, want to support other cooperatives by doing both of those things. So, so that's how we got started. Um, and this is our board of directors and they send their greetings to, to you all here in Bermuda. They are from all different cooperatives all over the United States. Um, some of them manage cooperatives, some of them work in cooperative developments, um, and they are nominated and elected by our members. So our 250 cooperative members get, a, get to submit nominations every spring. We take all of those nominations and put those forward to a popular vote of all members. The members elect our board. Uh, and, and I have to admit, as the executive director, there's a moment about, uh, about um, our elections are in April. And about March of every year, I start to doubt how democracy is possibly going to bring me a good board. Who's going to do a good job? <laughs> And then about a month later when the elections happen, I, I'm reminded of why democracy works. 
that in fact they give me a great group of people who are committed to the work we're doing, and I get to go back to to uh, to uh, to my faith in the system. But it's always interesting because I, I still, despite the fact that I work do this work every day, I still sometimes doubt that demo is democracy going to bring us the best thing, and, it, and it's amazing that it does. Uh, so our board, um, we have an 11-member board, as I said, they're nominated and elected by our members, and they oversee, they hire or fire me, uh, and they, and they, um, will, uh, they also make policy decisions, um, but it is our membership as a whole, all 250 cooperatives, who are the ones who get to make the big decisions. If we're going to change what we're doing, if we're changing our, our articles of incorporation, or our bylaws that, that determine how we operate, that is, that is for our membership as a whole to decide. Um, and, and in our organization, since we're a cooperative, we, are, uh, we, we have one member, one vote. So our 250 cooperatives, whether they are a five-person worker-owned business, just getting started, um, doing, doing uh, energy efficiency installations, or whether they are a multi-billion dollar dairy cooperative owned by the farmers, all of those, each of those crops has one vote, and only one vote, uh, but yet they're very different in scale, and that has worked very well for us. It brings a real diversity of perspective to our membership. So that's a little bit about, about us. Um, great, so I want to just recap what a cooperative is so that we're all on the same page. Sure. Oh, was there a question? Here, I have a mic. Yes. What is the criteria for the members to vote the board members into position? Yeah, they they can. Any board member can not. Any excuse me. Any cooperative member can nominate a, a, someone to the board. Their only criteria is that they have to be nominated by that cooperative. So one of our members has to believe that they would do a good job. And then it's, it's a matter of them running for the campaigning for that space and convincing the full membership that, in fact, they could do a good job. And so they put out their credentials, their experience, their commitment, the vision they have. And um, so this last year, we had four seats open for election. And we had uh, nine people running for that seat. So there was, it was a good competitive ballot, um, and each of the people put out a, you know, put out a statement about what they, what they wanted to see, why they were committed to, uh, to this work, how, what they brought to the table, and then, and so yeah, that's a great question though. And some cooperatives do screen that. Um, our board has decided to let the members nominate openly. Uh, yeah, hi, Christina. Um, just to follow on with that, um, that's quite interesting. So the members vote. Um, on the campaigns of these prospective board members. So is that, does it happen online? Do you convene somewhere? Is it one or two persons per cooperative business? Is it all the employees of those businesses yeah. nationwide, 35 states? How does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, um, we have an annual general membership meeting every year, and, uh, but many with our members all over the country, uh, they can't all attend in person. So we've moved to doing, we initially moved to doing a mail ballot if people could mail in their votes. Uh, we, would send, we would send out information, they'd get all of the candidate statements, they, we'd do some information, we'd provide information online, some videos, and then they'd vote. Uh, now we've actually moved to, we were able to get a, there's an online balloting system that we started using two years ago because we, we exchanged some advertising for uh, free use of their system because it's expensive, it was an expensive system. <laughs> And so we were, we had not, it had been prohibitive for us, but now we're able to use this online voting system, which allows for, um, for completely secret ballot and um, it screens, you have to have credentials to vote. But basically our, our members, um, each cooperative can nominate up to two members. They don't generally nominate more than one, but they could have not, they could nominate up to two people. And then it's put out to a general vote of the, of the membership. And within each cooperative, they have to decide how, who it is who's going to cast the ballot on behalf of the cooperative. So it could be that it's delegated to the general manager or a board member, or in some, I know that some cooperatives get together and, and, you know, and poll their members if they're small enough, um, but some of the larger ones, the general manager will do it. Are there any other questions? 
Great. I'm going to slide then into um, just some background about cooperatives. Uh, and again, this won't be new to, me to, to many of you, but just so we're on the same page. Um, so what is a cooperative? A cooperative, um, there are a couple of things that I uh, will start with. So first and foremost, a cooperative is a business. It's an enterprise, um, and it is jointly owned, and it is democratically controlled. So those are some of the most the, the, the basic principles that must be present. Uh, it, it's typically organized by a group of people um, then who are who have a common economic need. So that last part is a part that I find helpful to think about because why on earth do a group of people come together and start a business as a cooperative rather than some other type of business? And it's typically driven by some type of uh, it can be a, a, a shared social or cultural interests, but it also generally reflects some kind of economic need. Now, I'll admit economic need is a little broad because we have some, we have some brewery co-ops where they're making craft beer together. I'm not sure that's quite the same need as ones that are providing employment or access to groceries or access to housing. So the needs can, don't have to be, uh, they can be varied, but there's some interest. In the case of that brewery, they wanted to have access to good local craft brew beer. They formed, they formed a co-op to do that. Um, but of course, there are others who are looking at much more basic needs, uh, and that is often common. Um, as you may be aware, cooperatives typically adhere to a group, uh, a set of principles. There are seven cooperative principles that are put out by the International Cooperative Alliance. Uh, and um, and I'd say most cooperatives uh, you know, look to these principles for in their, in their uh, organization and work. And so it's voluntary and, and open membership. It's um, uh, democratic member control as, as uh, is implied in the, in the definition I gave you. It's also member economic participation. So what does that mean, right? That, that to us means that a cooperative, the members are act actively engaging. Some may be more active than others, but they're in some way engaging. In our cooperative, that means that they're either borrowing or investing, uh, and that they have an economic stake in our, in our organization. So if they aren't doing any of those things, then they wouldn't be a member in our case. Um, so some type of economic uh, participation is, is always needed of those members, but it can be small or it can be large, depending on the cooperative. There's also autonomy and independence. So separate, it's separate from government um, is typically one of the critical pieces of that principle. And, um, and, and that those cooperatives are providing ongoing education and training to their members and sometimes to the general public as well, but often that's focused on making sure that members are, are educated about their rights, that they know how the cooperative functions, and that they understand that they have access to other types of education. Um, and then um, cooperation among cooperatives is actually one of the principles that really resonates for our fund because many of our members join specifically to help other cooperatives because they're convinced this is a good business model and a good social model and they want to support others who are using the same model. And so they want, they cooperate with us to, help to cooperate with other, other cooperatives. And then concern for community and this distinguishes cooperatives from, uh, from many businesses. Certainly there are businesses that have a deep concern for community, but it is a fundamental principle for cooperatives that that be part of, of, their, of their work. So they're a business, but they hold, they hold on to being uh, that concern for community. Any questions? So I'm gonna just run through a few examples, some of which you'll be familiar with here on the island and some of which um, are, are from, my, from my work. Um, so Bermuda Credit Union, credit unions are a wonderful example of cooperatives. So a cooperative financial institution, they're all over the world. There are um, um, millions of members of credit unions around the world, and they, ad they adhere to the cooperative principles. So that's, that's one example. This is one from my backyard, or just a few blocks away from where I live. This is a worker-owned cooperative. And this is a group of, of, of uh, people who run a bicycle sale and repair shop. So they've got a very successful uh, business. They've been operating since 2002. 
They've been profitable in every year but one, and that was that the one year they weren't profitable was when they were expanding, and they had a lot of expenses that were planned, but otherwise they've been profitable every year. And they manage an employee base of more than 28 full-time employees. And, and this is Minnesota where six months of the year it's very cold, and the roads are covered with ice, and so many of us would not ride bikes six months of the year. So they also, their, their sales are a bit seasonal. So they're 20, 28 uh, employees work year round, and then they have another 12 to 15 who are seasonal uh, that they bring in. Um, and so they've been, we've been working with them for many years. About two years ago, they came to us to buy their building. It, it's a, uh, they're standing in front of it, and what you can't see, because they have a beautiful mural that they put on the front, is that it's a, was, it used to be a very ugly cinder block building. Um, next to another very ugly cinder block building. Uh, they'd, they'd fixed up the one and they had the opportunity not only to buy theirs, so they could ensure they could stay there for the long haul, uh, but also to buy the building next to it. And so we, together with a, we have a national cooperative bank the, that works with cooperatives exclusively, uh, we finance the purchase of the two buildings so that they could expand. They have three locations, they're thriving, and, um, and they're an example of, of a worker business, worker-owned business. This is the inside of their store before they expanded. It was very, very crowded. <laughs> and I, it, uh, a few details I had up here that they have about three million in sales. I think that's about two, two years ago now, that, that number that I uh, put up there. But, and they're continuing to grow. Great. Another cooperative, Ace Hardware. Good question? Yes. You said the hub that you purchased two buildings. What is the turnaround that they have to pay back for those two buildings? Yeah, they, um, I, I was trying to remember the details. I was involved in it, but it's been a, it, we financed it about a year ago. Um, it was, so they, the total cost was a little over a million dollars. They put up 10%. The bank put up about um, a, just under, just over uh, about 55, 60%, and we put up the balance of that. And they had, I think we gave, I think that we, we gave them two mortgages. The bank has a first mortgage. That was, I think, a 30-year mortgage. And we have a second mortgage. 30-year mortgage. However, the term of the loan, if we won't get into the weeds, my apologies if we don't. It, the term of the loan was seven years, because much like BDIC, we, do, we tend to do shorter term loans. And then after seven years, we'll, we'll refinance it. We'll renew it for another, for another seven to 10 years and go from there. But, um, so they have quite a while to be, I mean, the building is in, it's a solid building, even if it was ugly. Uh, before they before they did some improvements, uh, but it's a solid building that will be around, and so we were able to finance it over quite a long time and give them a traditional real estate loan. Hi, um, hi, Christina. Yeah. So, the workers, the employees, own the business. Yes, and we're just right. trying to go a little slow yes. to make sure everyone in the room yeah. is very clear with the new terminology, understanding as far as cooperatives, what you know, what's what's really happening here. In their business model, was it any exploration of can consumers also have an ownership, you know, be a member to be able to motivate them to continue to work with Hub Bicycle Co-op as far as maintenance of their bicycles? Yeah, you know, I, I, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I think they're pretty committed to the employees being the owners, though they do a good job of, I think, you know, they, they really pride themselves on great customer service. I have a really bad bicycle. I took it in there for repairs and they didn't laugh at me. I, I, I was impressed. That was my first introduction to them was, okay, I was expecting to be sneered at uh, because they have nice bicycles and they, they treated me very well. They didn't know I was, uh, you know, was a lender to them at the time because it was when I was new. Um, and so I think that, that while they provide great customer service, that they're really focused on the employees being the, being the owners. And I think that is about, they want a democratic workplace where uh, where the owners are, I mean, they don't. I think they don't want a boss. This is many of worker clubs sort of think of uh, that's a motivation. They want to work without having a boss. They do. They do have an you know they do have hierarchy within their structure. They hire uh, one of their employees as the general manager. Uh, each employee has their own different roles to play, and some of them have more authority than others. But at the end of the day, they're all the owners. And they're the ones who make the, you know, the, the full employee base elects a smaller board of directors. The board of directors uh, makes policy decisions and gets, it gets the work done. But it, it, 
but it, is a, it does have a lot less hierarchy than a traditional business. And their profits are distributed back to them each year in the form of, of, a, of patron, what are called patronage dividends. Um, instead of paying, paying external shareholders uh, the profits, the, um, they get profit sharing as employees. And I think that's a huge motivation, particularly because they've done very well financially. So they've been able to give back to their employees and, and create a fairly stable economic uh, situation for employees that in many, many other uh, companies, a retail and repair shop is not necessarily highly, um, highly paid, but they've done a nice job of creating uh, a real, real stability for their members. So that's the, a worker co-op. This is a completely different type of cooperative, Ace Hardware. There, I believe there are Ace Hardware stores here on the island, is that right? Um, and um, Ace Hardware is a huge cooperative. It is a purchasing, or, or sometimes known as a retailer's cooperative. And so a little bit about them. Today they have about 4,800 stores, uh, something like uh, 5 billion in sales in 60 countries. And um, they were actually just founded in 1924. Five hardware retailers in the city of Chicago came together and formed a joint corporation. Just a traditional corporation, five of them. And why did they do it? I think they found that rather than competing, it was going to be better for them to work together. And so they formed this, this corporation where they were all owners. And it, they operated that way for many, many years. At some point, <laughs> uh, in 1974, they looked at their model and decided that they had all of these retailers all over the country. I mean, it was you know, somewhat similar to a franchise model. But the retailers, um, they decided to sell to those retailers. And instead of a franchise model where the franchisee sort of works for the works for corporate um, and has to kind of do what corporate says, those retailers became the shareholders of the company and the only shareholders. So that all of, if you have a Ace Hardware short store, you have, uh, you are a shareholder in Ace Hardware, you have a vote on their, for their board of, of directors, there are, are um, you are the owners. Uh, it is, it is a, a model that is used primarily to increase buying power for those retailers, um, and therefore profitability. They also use it to improve their customer service because it gives them more research, resources than an individual standalone store would have, right? You can get the prices down, you can, you can get resources from, from corporate in a way that, you know, that you wouldn't have if you were a single store owner. But each, in, each retailer is independent, and, and so the cooperative structure is at the at the higher level where they're using this purchasing cooperative model. Any questions about that? We were, we were looking up a, a, a few good examples and, and uh, Football Club Barcelona came, came up as one. They are cooperatively owned by the, really by the fans. So I think the concept here is who's a better, who's, who's more committed to the success of a football club than the fans? Um, not, rather than having to answer to the interests of a single outside investor who's to decide whether or not they like this or like that, um, the fans are the, are the owners. It's a limited cooperative, uh, it has, and I don't know all of its inner workings, but, um, but in any case, I think it's a great example of where you, know, where you can create a, use a cooperative to get the owners to be the people who have the greatest stake in your business. I went, actually, let me go back. One, one thing I want to add is that it's also a great example of where you've got your kind of, you have cooperatives function very well in businesses that where you're balancing sort of a, a social good. You've got this, this love of the game and love of the team and, and the fans' passion for that with the need to have a profitable business and to be able to put those two together rather than a charity or a corporation, being able to kind of meld those two into a, into a cooperative business can be a great, it's a great way to do that often. Let's share another example from my, from my work, A1 Builders. So they're a, um, a, a design and build firm. They, they build resident homes um, and design them. And about uh, five years ago, the longtime owners, there's a couple who owned the company and worked in it. And about five years ago, the couple decided that 
they were getting ready to retire. They wanted to step back from the business. They wanted more time with family. But they were pretty passionate about their business. So what do you do then? Uh, they wanted to make sure that their employees retained their jobs. They didn't want to sell to a competitor who might close it down, take over their customers. They, they knew that there weren't necessarily a lot of other options to sell to, but they also, want, they also cared about their employees and their community. And so they started talking to their employees about buying the business. And so over the course of, of about four years, five years, they um, worked through the process and it ultimately, actually 2018, uh, we made a loan to a group of the employees who purchased the business from, from the former owners. Uh, what this meant is that the jobs stay, um, and in fact, um, interestingly, it's meant that they've been tremendously even, or they've been even more successful, because they were successful before that. But it was interesting, in their first year operating as a worker cooperative, their, um, their profits soared, and we asked their, um, their general manager, well, you know, what, what are, you, what's, you know, are you guys doing more work, have you got more employees, what, what is causing that? tremendous increase in your profitability. And they said that all of their workers were so passionate now that they saw themselves as uh, at a new level. They were always good workers, but now had a new level of commitment or even investment in the business. And that, um, that's, that's what they attributed it to. They'd done things like change policies to make sure people could take vacation. They'd done things to make sure that people could move up in their, in their jobs if they um, if they wanted to, and so um, you know, they, they said that was having a huge, huge impact. So um, here's another, here's a picture of one of their employees. So there are lots of other examples that we, we could talk about. Um, there are housing cooperatives that are owned by residents. Uh, we do a lot of work with housing cooperatives, very varied from, from apartments that are owned by, collectively by the residents. Each resident has their own apartment, but they collectively own it very much like what might look like a condo, uh, but, the, but the ownership is, is each of the residents in a cooperative. Uh, we also work with, um, with, we work with student cooperatives, um, and those are sometimes our one big house that is divided up into, into different uh, rooms, and people can rent so they can keep the cost of, of living down while they're in school. Um, and so a lot of different varieties of housing cooperatives, we work with, with quite a few different ones. Um, and then there are, there are grocery stores and there are, um, we, see, we see a lot of service businesses becoming cooperatives, home, people who provide home care, child care, coming together because these are hard jobs, uh, often pay very little, and I, I, at least certainly in the United States, and I assume that, that to be true almost everywhere. Jobs don't pay, uh, don't pay enough. But by coming together as a cooperative, they can, they can affect some of that and make, make it a better job. Oops, let's see. So what are some of the advantages of, of a cooperative business model? And I, I put up a few here, but there are, there are more. Um, so I mean, among other things that, you know, it's owned by the people who have the greatest stake in the business. Uh, the users or the workers, depending on the type of cooperative, um, are often those who are most, uh, most able to make the co-op successful. And by being the owners, they're making sure that they're making the right choices that are going to help with that success. Um, they, um, it, really, it really also, I think, gives a great line of, of information to, uh, to the owners about what their, their the stake is. For example, grocery co-ops. If, if the owners and managers are listening, uh, they, sh they can find out information from their member base about what what's working or what's not about their store, and there are other examples that we, that we can talk about. Um, we find that, the, that actually one of, the, one of the, there's a lot of economic benefits, but one of the great benefits we see that I'm still waiting for someone to get some good data on is that we see enormous amount of leadership development happen among people who are participating in cooperatives, housing cooperatives, people who participate in the board. They've never participated in a board before. They learn how to, how to run a meeting. They learn, uh, they learn an enormous amount of leadership skills, and then they often take those out to the rest of the community and use them um, in community meetings and in parent-teacher parent, parent -teacher meetings and things like that. And we see, these, we see this anecdotally um, waiting for someone to do some research on that. But um, a lot of leadership development as well as economic development that comes out of this. So um, we also see, and this, and this will lead to, our, we're going to move into to more capital and finance now. 
one of the opportunities is, is if you don't have one big investor who wants to support a business, being able to raise a lot of small investments from a broad membership base can be a great way to, to capitalize a business, to bring, bring the money that's needed to a business. So let's talk a little bit about capital and money. So when we think about financing a cooperative, one of the most important things is we want to make sure that the money that's brought in supports the cooperative. Now that's true with any business, as I, folks from BDIC will say, you know, they've got to get the business needs money that's going to help them be successful as a business. And with a cooperative, you add another layer. You want to make sure that you're not that you're supporting that organ that organizational structure, that democratic structure, and not um, and not undermining it. So, what would be an example though, to make it concrete? Uh, we often see small business entrepreneurs maybe thinking about whether they should get they could get could I get money from a venture capital or somebody who wants to put a big a large amount of money in, but they may want a stake in decision making. They may want to influence uh, the decisions. And in a cooperative, that could undermine your democratic structure. So finding capital that really aligns with, uh, with the democratic structure, and that also supports the business, uh, that's, that's a critical thing. So this is a quote from uh, the International Cooperative Alliance, put together a, um, a, the, uh, put together a book, uh, let's see, the, the Blueprint for a Cooperative Decade, it came out a couple of years ago, where they outlined how to build more cooperatives and more, a more cooperative economy. And, and this is one of their key points. So I'll give you an example of, of capital. There's all, every business needs a variety of types of capital. And here's uh, uh, what we, we use this is a capital continuum. Everything from equity to, uh, to debt. And, and um, where do you get sources in a cooperative? And this, some of these are very similar to any type of business. So you might get loans, senior loans, those are the kind of first priority loans. You might get those from a bank or credit union. Um, you also might, um, might find some, some other money that's a little bit more favorable from the city or government um, if you have programs for that. You also find that many co-ops can find support from other cooperatives. There may be other businesses that also will be happy to provide a loan or some kind of investment or help with another business. But we find that cooperatives in particular because of those cooperative principles and cooperation among cooperatives, often are, we found when you get enough of an ecosystem of cooperatives, they'll support each other. And so um, we see that quite a lot in the United States with co-ops making loans to other co-ops or grants to other co-ops to help them get started or kind of get over certain hurdles. Uh, loan funds, of course, are a great source like BDIC. And foundations, and I've got them, so the obvious one is that foundations will make grants, and if your cooperative has a, has a real social purpose or a social impact on the community, um, some foundations will consider getting, giving you a grant. Now there are touches to that if you're, not a, if you're not a charitable organization as a cooperative, so you have to find ways to have that work. We found some ways to get foundations to sometimes grant us money, but it, it, there are some tricks to, to working that out at times. You do that sometimes through another organization. Um, and then we, in the United States, we're seeing a lot of foundations making loans, low-interest loans, to support work that they believe is important. And it can be a great way to get additional dollars to the table. Uh, if the foundations here aren't doing it yet, we should connect them with some foundations in the U.S. who are, because um, it's becoming quite commonplace in the United States now to do that, and it's a great way to bring more dollars to the, to the, to the community's work. And then crowdfunding is a great way to get in either grants, uh, grants or, or comments. And that could be crowdfunding, uh, to me, it runs everything from you went and you asked a bunch of your friends and family to you put something up online and, and raise money that way. So it, there are a lot of different versions of that. Um, and then we're seeing a real interest in impact investors. And impact investors are typically high, high, net, high wealth individuals who um, are thinking about how to invest some of their money in ways that have more of a social impact. Uh, and so they're looking, for, they're looking for a financial return, but they're also thinking about what good, in the, and they can be a great source for cooperatives because they can, uh, you don't have to worry about the foundation question, can they lend me money, can they grant me money? They'll, um, this, the impact investors can be interesting. And an impact investor is basically anybody with money who's willing to think about they're investing in a slightly different way. 
Um, and and there's a, there are a number of organizations in the United States right now and in Europe and, and around that are really talking about what are the principles for this, how do we get more money into communities, into the work that communities are doing. So this is really just another way of framing the same information. Where can you get money? There are a lot of different sources and a lot of different types of money that a cooperative might need. So I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think we need to get too bogged down in the, in the types here, but, but basically everything from members being part of making, you know, making small contributions, making large contributions, depending on where they stand. We, um, for example, let me use, um, let me use uh, the uh, A1 Builders as an example. A1 Builders, the construction company, their members each have to pay a certain amount to become a member. That's their member equity um, that, that goes into their member equity. But in addition, when they need access to money, their members can make them additional loans. So a few of their members had some money that they had stashed away, and they were able to make uh, favorable loans to the business directly. So, so two or three members made a loan to the, to the, to the company when they bought it so that they could have more access to capital and not just borrow it all from external sources. They're very friendly lenders as members, right? They, 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 they can be patient, they know the business is going well, they're very invested, and they'll take a lower return typically. So it can be a great way to bring money in from very friendly sources, um, so you don't have to borrow everything from, say, a bank or a credit union or a loan fund. And um, I think that, that's really the only group we didn't talk about in the last slide, so I won't, I won't spend more time here unless there are any questions. So I, I, this is just to conclude on my part, and then I want also William to join me, because we're going to talk a little bit about sort of the Bermuda context and also have more time for questions. But um, I think right now in the United States, we're seeing a real renaissance of interest in cooperatives and the cooperative model. Um, I've, I've been doing this work just for 10 years. That's not that long. Um, but when I came in, I spent a lot of time calling uh, investors that I've worked with, foundations that I've worked with, other organizations and, t and talking about yeah, doing this wonderful work with cooperatives. It's so, it's so exciting. I want, you know, how you have to get involved. And a lot of them blew me off <laughs> and sort of said, yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk to you later. Um, in the last few years, that they have been calling me and saying, oh, I work with cooperatives. It's really exciting. <laughs> Where are we going? Why, why is that? I think it has partly to do with the, the, growing, the growing recognition of the inequality in, in the U.S. Uh, economically. Um, that's been, it's been growing in recent years. There's a much more awareness of it, and people are looking for alternatives. I think there's also a growing interest in um, community solutions. You know, there's been a lot of sort of, we'll go out and solve it each on our own. And I think we're at a moment where there's an interest in finding, finding joint solutions. So some of the major U.S. foundations um, are thinking about how they invest in cooperatives. And cities around the country, New York City, uh, two years ago, did a, put a million dollars into cooperative development. Said, let's see how we can help form cooperatives, help them get started. Um, and the um, city where I live, Minneapolis, has several initiatives to support cooperatives. Around the country, we're seeing that, and it's very interesting. And I think, I think the leadership at Bermuda and Vedic are, are taking on this is really exciting. I'm very much in line with what we're seeing in, in, uh, throughout the, the U.S. Um, one last thing. <clears throat> in 2018, uh, despite all the challenges of our Congress, we, uh, getting any sort of legislation passed at any time right now, um, we saw a new legislation passed called the Main Street Employee Ownership Program uh, Act. And what it did is direct our Small Business Administration nationally to work with cooperatives and to find more resources to support cooperatives because they really were, were not willing to work with cooperatives up until that point. So this was federal legislation that supported that work as well. So I think that speaks to the sort of change in, in tone that we're seeing uh, there. So now this, just to recap, um, what, you know, what, is, what is it about cooperatives? I think we can create, we can create jobs, we can create broader-based uh, community wealth through cooperative ownership. Rather than one person receiving most of the benefit, 
the benefit really gets distributed to the owners, whether those are workers, whether those are housing residents, whether those are the consumers of a, of a store uh, that, own, that are owned by the consumers, and so on. So I think um, the opportunity to really keep that money invested locally, you don't have an owner of a company who's living thousands of miles away or in another country and taking all the profits there. Instead, they're keep, those owners are keeping it right there in the community. And co-ops don't, don't send jobs overseas. So those co-ops will, will, uh, will make sure that the jobs stay locally because that's where, they're, that's where they're based, that's where the owners are. So I think now is an opportunity to talk about op opportunities in Bermuda. And William, do you want to join me? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christina, for laying a, a fantastic foundation. What's a cooperative, types of cooperatives. And um, just kind of finance 101. Whole broad and deep spectrum of knowledge, you know, certainly. And um, thank you for helping to be able to kind of get us started, yeah? And thinking about cooperatives in a different way. So before we launch into this next segment, you know, some local cooperative opportunities, concepts, if you will, just to be able to vision, cast, to throw some diamonds around and get you thinking. Um, as you talk to your friends and family and colleagues and business partners, let's get you talking a bit. So some of you have been to our past seminars, um, our workshops, our learning experiences. So what are you thinking? Is it a cooperative idea you're here? Is it just learning for learning's sake? Is it perhaps um, you know, someone else that you're taking this back to be able to share? So I'm going to put a few of you on the spot. I have kind of, you want to go first. Yes, you do. Okay. Go right ahead, ma'am. Right. I'm sorry, your name? Wahida Zarif. Can you talk and right into the mic? Wahida Zarif. Okay. And I'm already involved in a cooperative. We can, have... Um, can you, I'm sorry, can you hear the back? No. Yeah, so you've got to... Let's try this mic. Let's okay. try this. Okay, good evening. I'm Wahida Zarif. I'm already involved in a cooperative. Uh, we have a cooperative condominium association. And I've been involved in this sort of thing since the 1970s because I was a member of the credit union back, I guess it was like 1974. So I've always been involved in cooperatives, but the condo type living, that was new to me. So um, I'm share, a member of the board. Can you show which condo development? It's called Cherry Hill Condominium Association. Cherry Hill? Yes. Okay. And we're all owners and um, I'm basically getting all the knowledge that I can get and I take it back to the board. And um, basically, we're already, already doing most of these things. But it's very interesting learning new ideas and new concepts. Okay, fantastic, can thank I, you. Can I ask you a question? Did, did you, um, for financing for your, for your cooperative condominium, did you get where you able to get a bank loan? Well, we really or don't do have um, any trouble getting money, yeah, good, but um, we generally don't borrow money. Yeah. We just use our own money, yeah. and we'll borrow from one of the members. Because your, your members are all putting money in to the cooperative. Yes. And able to start. Yes. Great. Great. Terrific. Thank you. And you have an accountant that you employ, or are they a part of the team to be able to keep it all? I do that. You do that. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Do they pay you to do it, or is it a volunteer service? Okay. That I, build them. Sorry. I have another business I own, and I build them from the other company. Absolutely. So cooperatives doing business with their own, yep, with the their whole members. inner circle. Right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mr. Simmons, so you've been out with us for the past, so we've, this is our fourth cooperative development experience, seminar learning experience. You've been to three. What keeps you coming out? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Simmons. I'm a former member of the BIU Cooperative. It started at Cuxton Hill quite some time ago. Many of you may be aware that it failed because it did not get the support which was anticipated during the inception of the co-op. And there are other reasons as well. I'm not going to go into detail on that one. But why have I attended these meetings? I've attended these meetings because I'm highly impressed with the organization of the meetings, the amount of information that's disseminated to the participants, and very professional. 
uh, many times I got my pan out to take notes and after looking through some of the pamphlets and booklets the answers were right there and that's what impressed me uh, with respect to auditing, accountancy, uh, how to become a member of the co-op, how to get it off the ground and that sort of thing. So I have to commend each and every one of the PEDC and also visiting speakers such as Mrs. Jennings for the information that you have passed on to past members here, or past participants, as well as here this evening. And I pray that you'll continue on with this information. Bermuda needs it. Uh, I'm looking at areas of senior citizens. Of course, for his life, I'll be 77 years of age in December. And uh, I know we have the age concern and other organizations, but I do feel that seniors can also participate in cooperatives, uh, sorting houses, could operate a restaurant, just like they have at the hospital for the pink ladies. Uh, all of these opportunities are out there for the asking. And I'm looking at how we can get something like that off the ground for senior citizens. 5,000 members, $5 per week, multiplied by 52 weeks, that's quite about uh, $1,300,000 if my arithmetic is correct. $1 million, so senior citizens are laying on uh, being uh, millionaires just by as many as 5,000 people coming together and one thing can lead to another. Uh, for the past five years, I'll be quite frank, I've been doing some research work, and I haven't been out to many meetings. And this, uh, this meeting that you have put on is probably one of many that I could have come out, but never, because of my research work. And you'll probably see me at more if you, if you arrange them. And I'll be passing on much of the information that I have had passed on to me to other people, not only elderly people, but young people. We need the young people. Uh, I think we should put some more emphasis on young people, how they can become part of cooperatives in Bermuda. And I thank you very much. As a point, you say, uh, obrigado. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think you make a really good point that both seniors and young people can be really critical parts of of the membership base for cooperatives for, for a variety of reasons. That's a great, great point. Thank you. Okay, so Jonathan, did you want to say a few words? You've been out to a few as well and are quite passionate um, about the space. Any thoughts? Uh, sure. Good evening. Um, thank you for your talk. Very uh, educational. Um, well, I come to these because I think that the cooperative model has an opportunity to help us democratize the state and the economy in Bermuda. Uh, right now, our current structure, I think, leads to a lot of capital leaving Bermuda. Um, and so I'm just very intrigued to see how we can develop it further. Um, I think there's a lot of obstacles in the, in the way for cooperatives to get off the ground. One thing you said about the origin of a shared capital cooperative was cooperatives were getting hostility, I think, from the traditional lending institutions. Um, so I'm just curious how we get around that. And so, yeah, thanks. I might have another question later. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you and, and, and I'll just maybe comment just very briefly on that. I think that's a great point. I think um, one, gr one great way to deal with that potential hostility or lack of, I mean, it, it, typically it's the lack of knowledge and therefore you know, un they might be uncomfortable. And one of the things that, we, that uh, you know, by sharing, for example, um, using examples that exist locally and showing how they've been financially successful could be a great way to do, to, to do that, to educate. I spend a fair amount of my time talking to bankers about why it makes sense and how to understand and what to look for um, when they're looking, if they're going to consider a cooperative project. So um, I think there are a lot of opportunities, but you're right, you've got to, the, the not, not lack of knowledge is the main obstacle, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how it works in the U.S., but here in Bermuda, banks like to have some sort of collateral. So they don't really have a problem if they can take your house and get their money. But if you don't have collateral, I think that's one of the key reasons why they don't like to lend money to cooperatives. And, and that's, the, that, that's true, that's the same way in the United States. And that's where I think the role of the loan fund that understands how to work with small businesses and is 
and is looking at cooperatives can be so critical because they can look at things other than just purely collateral. So um, we, look, we look forward to working with Budic to yes. support your ongoing lending with cooperatives as they Yeah, absolutely. A lot of um, discussions, conversations, dialogue happening in the financing space. Um, I just shared earlier that BDIC, BDIC is doing direct loans. Um, uh, it's not easy, but it's not too difficult for us to be able to kind of put six months of hard work in and develop a first level cooperative loan pseudo grant fund. Um, it's just great talking to you all because we don't, you know, we haven't minted or financed our first cooperative yet. But, you know, certainly for any of you or your friends and family or anyone in the cooperative space, there are going to be concessions and incentives for early cooperative adopters. I've got an idea, I want to be in the space, here's my membership, here's my team, BDIC helped me, I've got a business plan, what's my value proposition, how do I pitch this to the membership, who do I start first, where do I have to be able to take it, what's commitment look like, how do I ground truth it, what's the beta testing, and then if we can help and bring others into the room to be able to help you figure all that out, and draft this solid business plan with a profitable business model to start, it's a whole bunch of free stuff for you to be able to help you on your way, as in, in any particular initiative to be able to get it off the ground. So that's why I said earlier, if you have something on your mind, if you've got a real idea, I'm not sure what it's gonna be, I'm still undecided whether it's gonna be a limited liability company, a charity, or cooperative, but I just thought I'd wanna come in and be able to share, happy to do it, all day long. And then we've got the Bermuda Credit Union. So we're having some conversations. You know, perhaps there's a partnership there as well as a half a dozen other conversations. But we think that capital is going to be um, the least of your challenges to be able to grow um, um, a cooperative entity. Yeah? Okay, so we've got the mic for a few more before we launch into a few ideas. Yes. Yeah. Fanon. Yes, good evening, good evening. Thanks, Bidik, for providing this opportunity to discuss co-ops. Um, thank you, Ms. Jennings, for sharing your knowledge. I've got a question on, once the co-op is up and running, um, there's a lot of opportunities there, but when you look at technology and automation, how does a co-op manage the challenge of potentially, with technology, having displaced some of the members that own the co-op. Is that a challenge? Have, have, have you engaged that as, um, as some of your co-ops in, in your experience? That's, what you that's, a, that's a great question. I'm trying to think of an example where we've seen that, because certainly that happens in, business, in businesses all the time. I can't think of an example um, in cooperatives. Or may, maybe a, another example. I, I, think, I think it really comes down to um, how the business then gets formed. I mean, ideally, the cooperative is looking out, is looking out, especially if it's a worker cooperative, if it's owned by the employees, they're looking out for their employees. So ideally, they're looking for technology that's gonna enhance what their employees are doing. And to, so maybe they stop adding new members. The members start to, they maybe leave because they've got another opportunity or they move on to something else or they retire or what have you. Not adding, you know, one way to manage that is to not add employees. But I've seen cooperatives have to make tough decisions and, and, and certainly make cuts, and they can do that. I think it really comes down to having a smart management management team, just as you would in business, but also being able to select technology that's going to allow them to grow into their existing staff rather than, than simply have the first option be to cut employees. Um, so actually, that it's not, a, it's not a technology solution, but I think there's some parallels with a bike company that I, that I talked about. One of the things that, that is very interesting about them is that they've spent, so they've been operating you know, for what, 17 years now, I guess, um, and uh, they're in this, in this business that is pretty seasonal, but they've found a way of figuring out what is the base number of employees that they need to do their work, and then they hire part-time seasonal people to come in. That can be a real problem for an employee-owned business, because wait, you know, you've got these other people who aren't really full-time, they aren't, um, and they've found ways of creating policies and practices that make that work, just through sort of diligent management and smart business knowledge. Um, so I think there are, I think they are an example of there are solutions that can be found, um, but, but it really, I mean, in many ways, it comes down to smart business decisions plus good process, internal process and governance and decision making, which the, which the cooperative model can support both through its democratic practices. So 
I don't know if that doesn't directly answer your question, but I think you asked a great question. I don't. I, uh, uh, that's what I could contribute to it. Thank you. Question. Yeah. Yeah, just that question here. Um, I've always been interested in starting a business, and I'm on the cusp of really starting, I think, a very beneficial and profitable business. But what if somebody is innovative, creative, inventive, if you will? Yeah, are there any provisions for anyone uh, who wants to get a patent for his ideas and is innovative? What, what provisions can be provi provided for that? Within a cooperative structure or just in general? Well, in, in, general, in general, or maybe you can give me uh, both examples. And, and I don't know the I don't know the rules here. I know more about how that works in the United States. I don't know, William, if that's something that you you can speak to. Yeah, to as far as patents. Patents. Yeah, um, we're not lawyers by trade, Abedic, but we have access to um, a number of lawyers um, that can provide advice like that. Any lawyers in the room? <laughs> ah, not tonight. <laughs> and so, if we can take that offline, we'd be happy to be able to kind of give you some value on that. Yeah. That's a great okay. question. I think that's a chance to get, get your information early to make yeah. sure you know you've got what you need as you go forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so Michael, if there's no one else, we can finish off with you. Yeah, Dr. Michael Bradshaw. Uh, thank you very much for um, your presence. Um, I come from a slightly different perspective in that you're talking about um, cooperative as a business venture. And I really, from the background of the friendly societies, and I'm here probably representing some of the friendly societies that are not here. And in Bermuda in particular, the friendly societies have been about a cooperative lifestyle. And that's important, it's a cooperative lifestyle. So we were not grounded in business, and I'm not quite sure what you mean by business, because it's, for me, business sort of speaks to making a profit. And the friendly societies were about cooperative uh, lifestyle, which is self-help and mutual help. And it was to raise the community, it was to do everything. So it has some resonance with what she talked about, the housing co-op, with the food co-ops, and that sort of thing. So I'm really here trying to understand how the financing, how we, uh, the old lodges, the old friendly societies who had assets, we own buildings, we own land, and but we have one thing that's a little difficult. Our democratic organization means that we don't consider ourselves to be the owners. We're only stewards of anything we have for the next generation. And so that creates a slightly different problem in that because the members don't own it, and the members are stewards, and the assets, therefore, are for the good of the community. They're not earned by the community. How do we go about funding that? How do we go about having people understand that if this belongs to you and it's been used to provide education in Bermuda, all of our primary schools came from the friendly societies. We had no education system. Uh, and if you're in Bermuda, you know that Bermuda has been a society that has been biased along two lines, along gender, males had most things, females didn't, and along black and white. Unfortunately, you look around and you see how many white people are here. Now, it's not that they don't have the same needs, but they've had access to things that we have not had, and the friendly society has provided that access because it had resources and provided that access to the community. A lot of those things are no longer quite so necessary because it came a time when you could get bank loans. And when you could get bank loans, you didn't have the old gift clubs, which we used to fund things. The old ideas whereby the friendly society is funded. I think the friendly society model is still relevant. In fact, I think the friendly society model is very, very important in terms of talking about cooperative opportunities. But there are some issues that we might find difficult when you talk about cooperatives as a business. Yeah, Michael, if I can just cut right there. So cooperatives are for profitable businesses that are owned by their members, and their members can be employees, they can be consumers, they can be hybrid mixes of it all. And so, did you have a direct question, or can we come so back I, to you on yeah, that I right can, now? I can respond to you. Well, yeah, my comment about question. that is, uh, is that there's something that's called businesses for the common good. Yeah. 
And so far, I haven't really heard cooperative yeah. people talk about that. And, and that, I think that's important. And that was in that impact conference that I attended last fall. Okay. That's, I mean, I think you, you, so I'll admit that often in many audiences we'll shorthand it to talking about businesses because that's, that's what makes sense. There, it, it, it is more complicated than that. You're right. Maybe I'll use our organization as an example. Our business, if you will, is making loans, right? But we aren't making loans, we, you know, there's, there's, we're very different than an organization that's making loans to make a lot of money. That's not what we're about because as the employees and as the board, we are stewards of those assets that belong to our members. They're pooling their money together, we're the stewards of it. It's not my money, I don't have that much. I don't have $13 million, but I'm, just, I'm one of the stewards of that money. And so it really is about, ultimately, we, we, we want to operate a, a business that is not losing money every year because if we're losing money every year, we're losing our members' money. And we won't be around in five years to do this. And so we need to operate a profitable business to use business lingo, right? I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's, we have to operate profitably. But the wonderful thing in my mind about the structure that I'm working in now, because I've worked with other loan funds that had different structures, I think one of the things I love is that we have this wonderful tension between making sure we can cover our costs and making sure we're meeting our members' needs, which means not charging them too much um, and not being reliant on somebody else. Because if, if we're reliant on getting foundation grants to subsidize our budget every year, then we have to answer to them rather than to our members. And so I think the cooperative business model, to use the business language, creates this, this important mix of, of looking out for the interests of the community, which our members are representing, um, and looking out for the larger community, even if they're not members. And it doesn't do us any good to support our members if to the expense of the communities in which they're working and serving. Uh, so we have to have a broader view. We answer to our members. We need to have a profitable business to do what we're doing, or we won't be around. And I think that's, that's also the case I'll do the construction example in a, quick, in a quick version just to give you a different one because you know, we're, we're a loan fund, it's not everyone's business, right? But the construction company, they have employees they want to pay well, but they are rooted in their community and want to provide a good service and they don't want to charge too much because they have to find this balance between earn enough through their business to pay their employees well, retain customers just like any business, but also they have a deep vested interest in, this, in the long-term health of their community in a way that not every business person might think of. Uh, it's, 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 they have it because, one of the reasons they're cooperative is because they had that shared sort of passion for serving their community. So I do think that, that what they're doing, as another, and, and other cooperatives are doing, is trying to meld that. You know, they've got, they're the stewards of some resources they have to look out for their members, but not at the expense of the community as a whole. In fact, the, the members within the community as a whole. So a business for the common good is a great way to talk about that, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I think you're right. I don't think that the, we, we've, we've been operating for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years in a, in a world that's very focused on, a, on an individual business model. And I think one of the reasons to talk about cooperatives as a business is because it explains it within a model that, pe that many people understand, but not, I understand that there may be others who understand uh, a deeper common good and stewardship model that, that may not resonate with that language. But I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a conflict with the concept. I think it's just the chosen language we're using. If that, does that... Yes, I, I think so, because we also have to remember that the friendly societies have been around for over 100 years. And so these are tried methods. So I guess I'm yeah. just a little uh, wary when people start thinking of business and think it's got to be profit. I think friendly society means charity, means you're not making a profit because there are not-for-profit businesses, which simply means that they just don't make a, a huge profit. Right. They, they cover expenses and cover growth. That's right, and I think that's a great distinction because I think there are a lot of different understandings of this. There's, there's business that it, where the profits are going, that, you know, traditional business, business profits are going to either the owner, the single owner or partnership to two owners maybe, or in a corporation to the shareholders. And you have nonprofits at the other end that, pe that people mistakenly think um, don't make any profit, but in fact, the point of the nonprofit means they're not distributing profits. They're not taking the earnings and giving them to somebody outside. 
and there's not a single owner who's taking that benefit. The benefit is supposed to be community-wide. Cooperatives sit between those two, and on the one hand, they are operating a bit, they might be operating a business activity, but they are doing so not to either have one person take all the profits or to have to send them off to shareholders who have, have bought shares in the company. Instead, it is the users of the business who get those benefits. And we didn't really talk about this, but what does that mean? That means that in a worker cooperative, profits are distributed to the employees. That kind of makes sense. You know, that's who's going to get the profits. But in a consumer cooperative, like a grocery store or um, other consumer cooperatives, a housing cooperative, where there's surplus, it can go two places. It can stay in the cooperative to help build for the next stage of development, or it can be distributed out to the members. In the housing cooperative, I don't know how you do it, we see housing cooperatives where that means that next year we don't have to raise rent. Costs are going up, but we can cover them because we've been, so there's an incentive to keep the, to keep the, the costs aligned with the expenses. In a consumer grocery store, we might see that a grocery, that the members, the consumers, basically, so I, I'm a member of a grocery cooperative in my town. For all of the purchases I make, if that co-op is profitable at the end of the year, they take those profits and distribute them proportionally to how much we all purchase. If I bought a lot, I get a bigger patronage refund, as it's called. If I, bought, if I kind of went there once in a while and bought a few things, I'll get a smaller one. So it rewards me for my use and basically gives me a discount on what I paid to the cooperative each, all through the year. So, so you're right, I mean, there's, there's the traditional business model, there's, there's the nonprofit model, which just doesn't, just keeps all of the profits in the company, in the, the nonprofit company. Uh, and then you have this cooperative model that's a little bit different. Thank you, Christina. Question. Okay, you were asking, you were asking. Well, I, I, at your, your housing co-op model, what happens if you make money in a, in a year, right? You're, you're, you bring in more than you spend, you have a surplus. Okay, um, what we've been trying to do with ours is um, we charge the members the same maintenance fee that we charged in 2002. So we try to operate without putting undue duress on our members because right now the economy is pretty challenging. So we try and keep the cost low. But the big problem that we have with operating in Bermuda is the cost of providing like property insurance and um, there are various fees associated with earning buildings in Bermuda. So we're trying to find ways of um, being creative with keeping those costs down. So by operating effectively, your housing cooperative, effectively you've been able to keep costs down so you haven't been giving increases the way, I mean, any of us who rent, we know that it's always going up and you've been able to offer your members no increase in your maintenance fees since, since 2002, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, we, we did um, do a traditional loan one year, um, I guess about 10 years ago, and we just raised the fees um, $25 for a year per member. Just for one year. And then we paid it back in a year and then we put the fees back. Thanks for sharing that example. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so it's 25. Yes, Stephen, you got a mic right there. You can just hold that left side button down if it's... it's just a, a question on how does it work overseas with in Bermuda there's companies and they pay company tax and there's charities and they're registered. A company... A, Cooperative registered overseas in, in, the, in the states. Yeah. So our our co-op. Well, so I don't know how it works here. For cooperatives in the United States, and there are different laws in every state about how taxes are handled. And then at the federal level, tax uh, income taxes. Cooperatives have certain benefits, um, and the cooperative benefits are that. So the corporation only pays taxes on the money it keeps on the, on the profits it retains and if it distributes them out to the members. So if, if let's take the construction company again, if they, they're profitable, they were very profitable last year, what, it, what happens with that money? They have to, um, uh, if they keep it in the business to reinvest and, and build, then they pay taxes on it. And this, I'm doing a little bit simplified version because there's some nuances to this, but there are, um, but then they, everything they pass through the employees is just going to be taxed at the employee level. So unlike some companies where you can end up with multiple levels of taxing, um, the cooperatives have some benefits. I don't know here how, how, how cooperatives are taxed. Is that, is that, is that no, your question? Well, we have, no, we have no statutes in place yet. So, so we're looking as, at a corporate, as any yeah. corporation. Yeah. 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 I think that was the question. Yeah. Would there need to be a legislative change to say 
form of yeah. cooperative and set up a tax for cooperatives. I, think, I mean, it's great if you can create some incentives for yeah. cooperatives within the tax structure. Obviously, that's going to have be really positive. I know that we, for example, one thing we see for small cooperatives is using the limited liability company legislation in the United States, the LLC. They use, we see some small cooperatives use that. They still organize democratically and set up all of their, their, their uh, governing documents accordingly, but they operate within that because it has certain favorable tax benefits. You get to a bigger cooperative, that's not going to work so well, but for a small cooperative, that can be, a, yeah. that can be an option. Yeah, we're looking at that now in terms of looking at our uh, statutes, um, our limited, um, right. our, our Companies Act, but there's a credit union. Uh, we're looking at some um, all over, you know, Canada and whatnot, to be able to kind of, you know, Wisconsin has some great stuff, yeah. and to say, you know, where is the oppor opportunity to design something that's robust and cutting edge 2019 in terms of just new cooperative legislation? Yeah. And, if it, and if it demands that, we'll do it. Um, but I think that um, every state has a bit of their own stuff. Yeah, every, every state in the... It's the hardest uh, thing to get your hands it's, around, it's, but it's, yeah. it's quite interesting. It's a whole world to itself. Yeah, but one of the things that maybe that has... I mean, is some co some cooperatives in states where there are not favorable le legislation have organized in states where there are, and then they operate as a as a foreign company in their own state because that's the way within the United States. Yeah. There, so there may I don't know you, you might be able to find some workarounds. Too. Yes, absolutely. And then <laughs> with, you, and then some other ones. in the first years, as far as taxation, lenient to none as cooperatives grow up, then it you know all of that we're looking at. So I think you know seven thirty now, Christina respecting your time, six to eight o'clock. We may end up before. I think everyone's hungry to be able to kind of get into this, yeah? yeah. All right. So just a few ideas that to be able to kind of cast a vision, sprinkle some diamonds, if you will. We shared this particular idea last December. So for those of you who heard it then, you kind of one or two of you, we've kind of built it up since then to so see if you kind of see some new stuff. Now, what does this mean? Jen, Gen Z Events Management Shared Services Co-op. Fancy name, I didn't create that. Yeah, but think millennials. Think of a young worker team. Perhaps you, you know, perhaps um, Simeon, is it? Yeah, yeah Simeon and Josiah. Josiah, Josiah. Josiah, okay, yeah, so ladies and gents are our students, our high school students, with Pay a Kid at the back. Pay a Kid um, was a cooperative business within BDIC, uh, within our first cooperative. We hatched them out, if you will. They were with us for a year. So Syree Bean is his name, yes? Was the entrepreneur that developed the concept of Pay a Kid to be able to embrace partner with high school students that were hungry, eager um, to work, and to be able to kind of create an interface to be able to have them serve the community in a very managed and organized way. What did I miss? Yeah, good? All right, so thank you for you know, helping us today um, at the back. Now, so maybe this might be you, or some version of you. It's gonna take some leadership, but okay, let's kind of work it out. Take this hall, St. Andrews, thank you very much for uh, allowing us in here to be able to kind of have this seminar tonight. So what we do, BDIC, is we, partner and contract with halls like this all over the island. So you've, if you've been with us in the past, you've been to St. Paul's Centennial, we have seminars in the Union, we've been to Leopards Club, you name it. I'm the Lodge, I'm at the corner, we've done a few seminars there years ago um, in the Unity building, across from the Liberty Theater, right there on the corner, upstairs and whatnot. Anyway, so our challenge is we, we avoid the hotels. You know, the hotels don't need our money. It's way too expensive. We can't control the AV and the food and the drinks in the hotel because they push you to electronic services. You've got to use them. And of course, the catering and the food is just way too expensive. We try to keep these free and very manageable, 25, 30 bucks for you. you can't do that in the hotel. It's just crazy. Anyway, and so our thing is to be able to kind of we need to stay central, right? You know, and we do have seminars in St. George's and Somerset and whatnot, but if we have it in St. George's, we want to kind of do it in town because Somerset people can't, you know, it's just kind of geographically weird. So if we go to the east and the west, we got to have two seminars, and, you know, and, and lately kind of we haven't been doing that. Central kind of works for everyone. But in a hall like this, 
it's just not business ready. It doesn't present a level of quality for us to be able to share with you. This is not perfect. This is not an A+. Plus. Not against, not, nothing against St. Andrews. Thank you very much for one just being real. So here is the opportunity. And why isn't it A+. Plus? Well, it's not, it's not A+, plus because ideally, these lights go from on or off or all on. We would probably like it if we could, off, 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 and in stages, because we want to dark this out up front and keep it light in the back. That's the best viewing lighting for this particular screen. The fans, okay, not bad, great looking. Yeah, let's kind of paint this up a little different. Let's get this floor looking nice and smooth and whatnot. And let's kind of pick up this whole audio video experience and graft it right in the hole. Right now, we hire outside contractors. Happy to do that. Happy to, um, you know, to support kind of, you know, small business. And we will continue to do that. But if we're looking to be able to partner and have a resident kind of hole, our go-to space, because we want to make sure that it's a first-class experience. This little curtain needs a makeup here. We can probably pick up a whole new screen and leave it here. This whole speaker system here stays here. The whole audio video mixing board is built in seamlessly within the whole venue. The opportunity is the worker co-op serves as the interface to St. Andrews. They just want to be able to rent the hall. They're not interested in everything that we just said, perhaps. Look, the hall's here. We don't have any funding. It is what it is. You want it or not. Yeah, perhaps. But, you know, we would like to be able to kind of work with Simeon and Josiah. 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 I got you. I got you. I got you. At the back to say, hey, guys, is it all set up? Yes. Um, you know, beat it. You know, it's all set up, all straight. Yes, you wanted the screen. Yes, front face. Yeah, you know. Um, how many tables? Yeah, you're all set up. Tablecloths. Here you are, um, you know, your PowerPoint pre presentation um, is all loaded up. Here you go, here's the clicker. What time are you coming? We got your food at the back, thank you very much. We got the service here if you want them because we know your people want to just be able to sit and eat. How else can we help you? And that is the opportunity that perhaps here, there are holes like this all over the island that, that might love a proposal to be able to say, hey, you know what? Here's how I can continue to make money. And this is like a little kind of dirty diamond. Did you all know that this hall was here and it's rentable and whatnot? Have you all been there before? No, 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 it's a beautiful little space. Don't get me wrong. But it just can be loved and hugged in a way that we would be like, fantastic. You mean we don't have to, you know, yes, you're gonna come and pick up our flags and our banner bugs and set them up and break them down and take them back to our office too? Great. How much is that gonna cost? We'd be happy to just kind of, you know, just pay that invoice. And so the whole worker experience here is not just perhaps partnering with here and maybe other kind of little unchecked diamonds all around town and just east to west, is to be able to build up a little network of spaces that would love to contract with this little youth or other little worker co-op that was owned by its members to provide an upgraded seminar business experience. Many of you may have needs that you say, well, where do you take your church groups, other organizations? Where do you take your meetings? What would you like? Is this satisfactory? You know, would you like something a bit different? But instead of just dealing with the church, you know, the administrator is not in, how do you get a hold of them? You deal with this little co-op group that has this website that's a professional, professional service provider to ensure that when you show up, you have everything you need. It's amazing. Now, Who's going to host? It's going to be paid for. Halls, equipment, screen. If we just looked at the screen, this is too big, yeah, you know, for um, you know for tonight. But two grand. These speakers are alone are a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars each and whatnot. Microphone, everything over there, but gaming on the table and whatnot. Buffing the halls, the chairs, the tables, packed away. All sorts of trolley systems, a website. Twenty thousand. <sighs> Yeah, committed, able. Oh, Mr. Spriggs, here's my group. You know, the five of us heard that concept. We want to talk about it, but we don't have any money. Perhaps BDIC can step in with this fund that we create to be able to say, don't let that be the concern, because what's most important, the passion, the commitment, the desire to move ahead, do the work, build the plan. To say, I heard what you said. I don't quite, you know, we don't quite see it like that, but here's the opportunity 
that we want to be able to embrace. The renters have to accept low quality and consistent services. Don't get me wrong. Don't go back to St. Andrews and say, Spriggs was chatting to you last night, okay? I see you laughing. I'm not saying that, yeah? All I'm saying is that it's an opportunity for perhaps a business, because the co-op is just another type of business. It could be another, you know, but I'm not here to be able to push limited liability concerns or charities or nonprofits. We're here to push co-ops. And there could be a co-op opportunity that could be in place to be able to embrace, embrace little unloved diamonds like this to bring them into a, a level of, of, of quality and professionalism that organizations like BDIC would love to be able to work with these entities on. Okay? Renters are inconvenienced by having to deal with multiple service providers because no single provider can provide a one-stop solution. You have to contract with Star Time, happy to do that, the food and this, you know, it's about five or six different bills, invoices, conversation, email, streams, people that we have to deal with to make these things happen for you. So that's the current state, yeah? So Christina, what could be? I talked about that, a, work, a worker, a multi-stakeholder, what does that mean? That maybe there are three, four, five young people, could be more, that own the business. But it's also owned by St. Andrews, they're a member. St. Paul's Centennial, they're a member. Leopards Club, any whole that is saying, I love the idea, so what do I have to do? What do you need from me? Nothing. We will provide all the equipment and services. All you have to do is just do X, Y, Z, a minimal lift, and allow us to take this new buffed hole and promote you to the island for new increased business because no one knows about you in this new state that we're going to make you. And through BDIC, we provide to be able to help you to kind of move forward. Okay, so you can also be separate of food service. Many, many of these halls, like this, this place, I didn't know, the kitchen is right behind you, Kim, through those glass doors. A commercial kitchen in there. Most of these beautiful little halls have great little kitchen facilities, food service, chicken leg, peas and rice, macaroni and cheese. Yes, I want the chicken. Yes, all I have to do is tick food, 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 drink, water, whatever the case may be. It's a little menu there, show up, and it's just provided by hardworking, committed entrepreneurs. Partnerships, agreement with venue providers, of course you would. Increased connections to new networks, local and corporate business. Tons of little mini organizations out there that would love to come into these new buffed up halls to do all sorts of little amazing things that you go into now and really don't see. Percentage of profits go to participating facilities and obviously those employee members. Yeah, is that a vision? Did we, did we you know, kind of put that out there and whatnot? But right now, we're dealing with the church. All I'm saying is we would love not to and be happy to deal with this concern, this entity, this little young, and I say young because, you know, these are, this type of business, website, customer service, showing up, table creation, audio, video, are services that young people, I think, would love to do, and that's a business model that is easy to cut your teeth around. It's not brain, it's not rocket science, not hugely difficult. Showing up, do the work, here you go, here's your microphone, your presentation, and after, set up, pack away, thank you very much, here's your video, Here's your interview. I'll give you the full hour slide, but I also kind of uploaded you for the 15 minute little cut too. That's what you asked. Here it is, all the items checked off on the checklist. Thank you, Mr. Spriggs. I'll see you next time. Yes, Dr. Bradshaw. <coughs> yes, yeah, so if I'm understanding, what you're saying is that there will be the service providers as one sort of arm of the co op, and there will also be the people who have the facility asset as also members of the co-op. Could they, be. And, and they would all be together in a cooperative alignment. You, you could facilitate that. Well, I, I don't mean yes, you, but yeah, you yeah, yeah. So what I'm doing now is I'm just sharing a thought that says, you know what, co-ops in my limited experience are sometimes beautif beautifully born to solve a problem. We're having a problem. It's a challenge. It's okay. 
don't get me wrong. I'm like, yeah, you know, I think we did an okay job today. We came in, it was quiet. You know, we, uh, you know, we got the air on, fans are rolling, screen was great, audio, video, comfortable, got a little food for you, but we can do it better. And we and, can do it more efficiently. And one way you could do that with a cooperative would be to have two different classes of members. So you could have the employees as one category, and you could have the hall owners as another, and so they might contribute at different levels. The employees are contributing their labor. Uh, the halls are making their halls available at preferential rates. What they each get back might be different. You know, the, for the employees, it's based on a sort of an hourly or a percentage of the overall take. The halls are getting something on percentage of, of the bookings at their hall, so there's an incentive for them to make theirs favorably. So, I mean, there's some creative ways you could do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. And, and, and an, another version that that makes me think of, which is a little bit different, which, which I've seen, we've, we've seen uh, with the folks with the video and, and the audio here, we've seen some groups come together. You know, they've been independent video and photographers and audio people, and they kind of contract with each other regularly and they form, ultimately come together and form a cooperative to do that so that they don't each have to go looking for business. They can kind of have this more professional business that has all of that under one umbrella. This is different. This is a different yeah, thing. Yeah. But, you know, it, but it, it made me think of it as we're sitting here. It's another example where, like, they're working together independently and they want to maybe continue to do their own kinds of projects, but if they work together, they would have a lot more, they could get a lot more projects, they could divide them up, um, bring all of the resources together. So there's a, lot of, a yeah. lot of things that can come up from um, related yeah. to this space need that could be cooperative. It's just, a, it's just yeah. a nice, clean model that, you know, I mean, for instance, you know, St. Andrews, there are easy half a dozen places like this centrally. And, um, and BDIC, I, 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 I'm telling you, is not the organization we deal with other peer government private organizations that always have seminars, workshops, experience, and that's just a corporate business. We're not even talking about private, you coming in, having a birthday party, this, that, and the other. For instance, you could morph it multi-purpose, right? I'm just saying from a business space, what we would need to say, yeah, this is A plus. Yeah, this is fantastic because, you know, because we're gonna, you know, our spec is gonna be, well, yeah, these floors gotta be done. Yeah, you know, there's no sense leaving them like it is. Let's give them a nice clean wax and whatnot. Let's repaint. Let's do something here so that when you come in, it's like, wow, this is a really nice space. That's what we wanna create. Now, it doesn't mean that, that if we do that, that we, we wouldn't want to just stop here. We would, you know, so to answer your question, if we were to entertain the right group or groups, we could do a whole lot, but our major work could just be to break down obstacles and clear a highway about something, how something like this could proceed on the entrepreneur's terms. It's still that youth group or senior group, Mr. Simmons, it's still their business. And we're here to help support uplift, motivate, facilitate, empower, and to bring the right people to the table to help make something like this happen, should it be so. This is just an idea. And we have at least a dozen ideas like this. We don't have time to go on tonight, we're just sharing. Yep, um, you know, Christina, and, and it doesn't mean that a co-op group could say, you know what, it makes sense for us to privately contract with that entrepreneur that handles the audio video. That person isn't in our group, we just can't see together, but we're happy to pay Denise as a private contractor to provide the services at, for the whole experience. But at the end of the day, that's what I want, and when it's on time, that's the price, and yeah, opportunity, yeah. I'd like to ask Christina a question about the way that co-ops operate in the US. Um, recently, there's been a lot of talk about cryptocurrency and blockchain. Do you have any co-ops in the US that are using those um, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies um, in their uh, sort of operations? That's a great question. I don't know, um, I don't know of any that are using cryptocurrency, although I've, uh, but I'm also uh, I, I'm not well, uh, not talking to a lot of groups that might, there, are, there may well be some. But I am hearing a lot of talk about the blockchain, which I still don't understand, even though I've had it explained to me about 10 times. And I guess I'm not sure it'll ever get through to my, my head, but I'm sure my kids understand it, no problem. But, but I, I attended a conference, uh, 
uh, that was full of, of groups that are looking at cooperative solutions and to use blockchain technology in cooperative uh, ways. Um, it was a um, technology-focused cooperative uh, conference that was, it's been held in, in New York every year for the last few years. And it was exciting, and I didn't understand most of it. But so I think the answer is yes, and I'd be happy to connect you with, or, or anyone, with people who are thinking about it who know more than I do. <laughs> okay, and that's something that we'll be looking at at future yeah. seminars as well. That's a great question. So if you follow our space. Okay, so any, any, any questions on this before we move on? Okay, so happy to help, you know, look, I, I, was, uh, I was with you on June uh, 4th, you know, look, you know, that, you know, some of it I didn't quite understand. Look, I brought a friend of mine, you know, look, and, and we can get into it at your convenience in our offices privately, yeah? Okay, so Christina, I think you've got the clicker. Oh, I can, yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right, so Mr. Simmons, I know you got to hear it again, yeah, but um, <laughs> we're going to be brief here because we do want to end on time. So the sports club cooperative, yeah? Now, why are we thinking about um, you know, sports clubs? Well, strategy-wise, it makes sense that we focus on institutions, friendly societies, lodges, and we've had a lot of conversations with Dr. Bradshaw here, and sports clubs that we're starting to, in a very deeper way now, have the heart and soul of a cooperative, but perhaps don't function quite like it in regards to the membership and profit sharing and not operating as a business. Many sports clubs are nonprofits, charities, uh, some, are prop, uh, some are charities and have a business arm and whatnot. But as you know, and we had the sports clubs in last night, um, about a good dozen or so from east to west, as far as executive and management, to be able to kind of give them a special presentation co-op just on um, just the sports clubs last night at Beatty. But they kind of all kind of, you know, in principle agree, assets in need of renovation, disrepair to the facility, large facilities, tough to keep on top of law, painting, cracks, bathrooms, you name it, all around, just needs work, takes money, yeah? Single minimal revenue streams, bar, or maybe a, a bar or two, um, some have a little minimal kitchen, some rent kitchens out to outside service provider and just get that little static rent. It's not really kind of kicking like that. Project program management challenges, you want to rent the field, you want to rent the facility, who do you get, who do you call, administratively, can you see the club on the website, is it all orderly? It's all over the place, yeah? Committed member base, is it committed? Most clubs, I think we heard last night, Christina, 100 members, 120 members. You know, that's, that's not a lot. I think we heard one club that was up in the kind of 300s, but, you know, think about it. You know, you all have your favorite clubs, perhaps. You came through, your son came through, many minors and whatnot, your husbands and, and you know, significant others may go out and um, um, have a fruit punch at the particular bar or whatever, you know, that they patronize and whatnot. Those are my colors, kind of, you know, ride or die, yeah? And so, if, you know, they have that base, but the base is not paying out, it's not investing, it's not, it's not really doing anything financially to be able to sustain and help grow and help the club to thrive. They make inconsistent member benefits. Yeah, I pay 120 a year, but I just pay because it's just a club and I want to be a member. I don't really expect anything from it. It's not defined. I can't show you any, anything that says, you know, these are my benefits for the club. And as far as member communication, is it the AGM once a year? Is it, do I fade? Am I invisible until then? It's a hodgepodge of all of that. So what are we talking about, Christina, in terms of that? What could be the vision of, why is that so small? Uh, all right, so the vision of what could be. Develop, well, maintain, no, that's fine. Develop, well, maintain assets and infrastructure. Yeah, multiple revenue streams, cash flow. Yeah, easier said than done. How do we do it? Yeah, members to be owners. Optimum decision making and forward planning. Sharing the power. Yeah, we heard earlier that the members elect the board. Yeah, board hires the GM, you know, CEO and whatnot. And, and we have here, you know, what could a hundred members kicking in a thousand dollars a year for three consecutive years do? Now, why would I pay a thousand dollars a year? Well, you know, and then we kind of get into clear member benefits and value proposition. Consortium of club cooperatives. Well, I just forget about that a minute. So what could happen with this equity investment for three consecutive years? And so we're developing, and Mr. Simmons, what's coming next as a, as, as a result of all that kind of brainstorming and, what, and, 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 um, and dialogue with your clubs and all your peers and brethren last night, 
we did all these flip charts all around the world. And I think what we came away with to say, well, yeah, a thousand dollars for a hundred members, a hundred grand for three consecutive years. Why would you put out a thousand dollars to be able to say, yeah, I'll commit to that annually? Well, there's a business plan in place. I understand where the club wants to go. It's communicated clearly. It was backed up in the presentation by executive and people that I hadn't seen before. Uh, oh wow, they got the old guard out, and Mr. S you know, Mr. Simmons, who is 72 years old, who was a captain of the club 50 years ago, he's putting in 50 grand. So it did some work to be able to kind of have some anchor investment so that it made feel, me feel a bit more comfortable. And you know, these are no point endeavors. I need the 100 grand to do this with the club. It's gonna be repairs, but it's smart thinking to say, these are the things that the money's gonna be spent on to create sustainable, forward-thinking revenue streams that remove the club from a charitable year-to-year -year handout scenario. And I think once the business plan, the, you know, the value proposition, the business profit-making model was in place with committed membership focused on a whole new vision for their club. They've done the work, they've had potential donors in, they've talked to you to the community, they had a meeting or meetings with the 200 members, 300 members came out and listened and they got feedback and they took it back and worked into the plan. And then they're in a whole new space for equitable investment that makes sense other than we just need some money for the short term fix. And this is the path that we're looking to be able to travel to be able to open up wider. So clubs who are just looking for, if he doesn't want 20 grand, we can loan you that 20,000 with our sports club, you know, micro loan. That's easy. We've got the application in place, come by tomorrow, we can talk about it. But if you're looking for upper levels, oh thank you so much, Denise, amazing. If you're looking for larger money, if you're looking to be able to tap and be able to kind of be in a space with new givers, if you're be able to excite and make promises to your membership in a cooperative, <coughs> in a cooperative structure, then it's about a whole different set of work. And all we're saying tonight is that BDIC is here to be able to help you to be able to, you know, whether you're a club or whether, just as ideas, concepts, that here's the space, here's one of the spaces that we're moving in strong, and you can take and kind of just say, oh, okay, I get it, and apply it to your own, you know, cooperative thinking, your own you know, cooperative idea that we have yet to discuss and talk about individually, of course, and I'm sure that we would um, you know, love to do that. Okay, so, um, you know, Christina, what were your just quick takeaways from the club's meeting last night as we talked, because you know, we had about a good dozen flips all around the room, some real work ahead, some great dialogue. We talked about some larger numbers here. We had one club that shared that they wanted to be able to, get, um, to raise 1.4 for a new building, a new facility, a new premises, a whole new way of life for their club. And we took that and we just kind of did a live brainstorming on the spot about what it would take to be able to raise money like that um, to be able to kind of help. And you know, I, th I, I thought that we were very vocal to say, we want to help, give us a call, happy to talk next steps with you. All right, yeah, do a blind, I guess. Oh, there yeah, we go, yeah. now it's on, now that I... Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I thought that there were a number of great takeaways. I mean, I think you're right that one of the, one of the strengths of, for the clubs uh, working cooperatively is that there's so many of the kind of, from a value standpoint of, of the commitment to the club, the membership structure is already there as an association, and so that, that's a great opportunity. And an opportunity to get members to invest more even, it doesn't have to be a, a lot, right? I mean, you, the, the, the investments that we talked about last night could be figuring out what is the level that our members could, what, what is the level that our members could all give would be one thing, and start there. And then say, wait, are there some members who could maybe do more? And how could we, there's some structures we could use to then have those who are able to give more, put more money in. They don't get more power, they don't get more authority, but they get, they'll, get their, you know, they'll get their money. If it's a donation, they won't get it back, but they'll get some recognition. And if it's a loan, they could get it back. Um, but so looking at the broad base of membership at some level that everyone could give, and then where else could you hit? Maybe you've got a few members who could give substantially. 
um, or make a very friendly loan substantially that could allow you to not take as big a loan from the bank and save some money there. So there's some, uh, I think, a number of, of investment and grant ideas that came out of it. Um, it was a, it really, I was very impressed by the sort of the, the commitment. I mean, we have all these volunteers there sort of thinking about how to make their clubs better. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, and starting with the same I, right? So before we can think about we, you know, we're totally invested in the I, you know, my business, my concern, how do I keep control? And so cooperative thinking is about the we. And so what's in it for me? What do I get for that thousand dollars you're asking me for? Well, yeah, you got my attention now because I, you know, I've got a one-year-old. And yeah, most likely I do want to play for the club. They're going to be, yeah, you know, as far as football, I do see it as a part of my life or the club's activities and whatnot. So my son's taken care of. Yeah, you kind of got me there, you know, my attention. I see how my club can be within these new developed football programs, these, you know, these cricket programs, these other types of sports that you want to bring along, you know, with the investment because this new build or this new prefab or this new thing that you're going to do is going to do amazing things for my son or my daughter. Now, what's in it for me? Well, oh, wow. You mean there could be, you know, part-time job, I could be part of this committee or program, that interests me because that can help my career and I can see how I can kind of be a part of that. And as that larger donor, okay, well yeah, you're asking for, you know, 50, 100 grand, what's in it for me? Well, good sir, we'd love to be able to kind of bronze you and put that plaque on the side of the building so that you can live forever. What is, what is that thing that hooks us to participate some way? It's difficult to do individually if you haven't really thought about it. I'd like to say that we have all the answers at BDIC, but we're happy to get the right people in the room, um, you know, for to make these types of things kind of take next steps. It's not easy. I don't think we can point to one club, one football club, one cricket club in the island that says, wow, they raised 1.5 and did that. Can we? So it's not easy. Um, it's not a new conversation in regards to, you know, we've heard clubs talk about, oh, let's get together and get night lights. You've heard clubs get together and say, let's buy our own scaffolding for cup match. We've heard clubs come together and say, let's buy our own alcohol. We talked about that today. Talk a bit about the procurement co-op, purchasing co-op, real quick. Yeah, um, well, and I, you're just making me think of one that I know. There's a group... Um, there's a group that started out in Washington, D.C. It was a couple of churches that decided to start buying together. So they're all, they're, they are all, um, you know, they're all churches. I think they're all, uh, not, you know, nonprofit organizations. That, and, um, but they came together and formed a purchasing cooperative because they were all buying the same things. And they could get a better price if they could buy together. So they, start, they formed this small group. It started uh, five years ago, six years ago. I just met with one of the founders of it, and he was telling me that they're now going out into three or four more states because they've got something like 25 members where they are, and they've got another group in another part of the state, and another there, and they're going out to, because it's such a great idea. You've got people buying, if they can buy together, and they're buying, I mean, all sorts of things. Now, I mean, so from supplies to, I don't even, uh, I think even contractors getting you know, preferential deals with certain contractors that they need to come do work in their facilities. Because what they found is they had such similar needs. And so that's, that, that's an example. And with the, you know, I think the opportunity potentially with the clubs would be to think about, well, are we all buying the same thing? Can we set aside our competition uh, that naturally might exist in the interest of getting a better deal you know, uh, on, on some things that we're all buying together? Uh, it doesn't really give one club an advantage over the other, so we know we're, if we do it, it won't, it won't put, you know, it's not going to let the others get ahead. They're not going to win the game, the match, because, because we bought toilet paper together. So it's a, it's a safe thing to do, but it also could make a big financial benefit. Or you could contract with, a, with some services you all use part-time so you can get a better deal because you've got, you've got it spread out over, over multiple clubs. Some, you, know, I don't know if you, mow, you have someone who mows all the time, or do you have someone who mows just a couple days a week? Maybe you can... Five clubs could get someone to mow, you know, to mow full time. I'd probably pay a fraction of what you're paying individually. So those would yeah. those would be different ways that that a purchasing cooperative might work. Sure. So we're in the space, letting you know that that's a highway that we're paving with the clubs. 
sharing it tonight as an idea for your own cooperative thinking, for your own you know, particular um, ideas or concepts that we're happy to talk about you individually. To take the toilet paper, yeah, let's throw the toilet paper up in the sky. So now, most of us will go to a price right or a bulk, the cheapest bulk provider and pay the CEO and the shareholders that own that company our money for the gallon of bleach, for the fab washing detergent, for toilet paper and the big pack, and all of that. And that's the best we can do on island. Is that right? Yeah. Locally, yeah, but a purchasing co-op in its very simple form is just 10, 20, 30 of us, friends and family, calling around email and they say, all right, everybody's got the 350, the 250, the $125 in, that you are the collector, assemble, organize, and get the container of all of that stuff in larger prices and have island construction or whoever drop that container at the field and everybody comes on Saturday and cleans out and that container is empty to be taken away. Simple as that. Coming together and, and, and so a for-profit business, sure, you just took that profit and took it back as savings yeah, yeah. with the increment that the 20 cents on the dollar you saved, so instead of giving it to price right, you kept it yourselves. And instead of 100 cents on the dollar that you paid then, you paid 80 cents. That it was more profitable to you that as a group, you came together and did a very cheap purchase overseas, drop here, no, no storage, no rent or anything, and boom, off you go. Okay, so as we start to think about these particular, and there's no reason why the condo, so do you do that? Do the condo members buy collectively all household dry goods, cereal, all that type of stuff? Um, well, we, we actually don't, don't do that, but um, no, we don't buy um, goods collectively, but we buy services collectively. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that might be an idea. You know, what, how many members in your co-op? Six. Six, okay. And six, set, six families who own, yeah, okay. So an idea for you. All righty, I think we're done. Five past eight, any questions, comments, before we wrap up? Yes. I just wanted to know. You're available most days? Are we available most days? Yeah. Would you like to meet right now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. And I can, I can give you my um, drop. Yeah. I can, give you I my can email you. you? Yes, yes, you can. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to meet you. Yeah. You had an idea. Looking forward to, to um, hearing it. So you had an idea. You came. You're not sure. Did you want to share anything about, no? Not right now, I'll give you a pass. Yes, Simmons, you got something you want to say? Do you guys have people that, um, do you guys have people, workers that help build cooperatives at BBC? Do we have people, um, uh, workers that help build cooperatives at BDC? We're learning co-ops just along with you. I mean, we only started this nine months ago in the space. Um, um, you know, the more, the more we learn, the more we realize that we don't know. Um, and so, yes, from a foundational knowledge, but first, what we can do a great job with is help you to build a profitable business plan. That's where it's going to start. And then the co-op piece just kind of almost layers on top, because it starts as a profitable business firm. Yes, yes, all of that. Happy to help um, all day long. Got our, you got my email and whatnot. So yeah, happy to help. Happy to help. Yes, sir, Mr. Simmons. My question is directed to Ms. Jennings with respect to online voting. I was very impressed with that uh, statement you made that people vote online. It used to be postal voting. Uh, Bermuda is a very small island, about 21 square miles, not even two miles wide, and. Um, I just did a little exercise in there. The 5,000 people, nine parishes, that's about 555 people for each parish. But what I don't see in Bermuda, and I've been looking at television, I read the Royal Gazette daily and all kinds of other means of communication, and I don't see any meetings. Mm -hmm. We've got one here tonight. 
but you'll probably never see a meeting amongst the people that really would like to see cooperatives get off the ground. This is a good meeting. You're here, my good friend, uh, Mr. Sprite. William, William. But I'm talking about the real people that would want to get a co-op going. Yeah. How would we start this here? I, I know my good friend in the lodges, Mr. Bradshaw. Uh, Bradshaw. We need to get some meetings going, some down-to-earth meetings amongst people that really be serious of getting a co-op started in Bermuda. Okay. okay. Shoe store business, clothing store, sorting business, restaurant, hotel, guest house, cottage county, transportation, services, whatever. Yeah, Mr. Simmons, so if I can just cut in there. Yes. So, so like any business, yes. co-ops are a branch on the business street. Yes. And so it's thoughtful planning, it's the leaders, the, 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 the hard workers, the thinkers, the concept people, the obstacle removers, coming to the table, um, either individually or collectively or yes. with BDIC or whoever, to say this is the idea. I heard you guys were talking about all this stuff that you do to help people. What are you going to help me and my friends here? Because we got this great idea that we want to move and we think a co-op concept can work. Yes. And so that's where it's going to start. And, and so now we're planting seeds and we've spoken to other individuals, certainly like yourself, they brought what we love to do is talk with you, if you have something that you want to do, you mentioned seniors, let's talk about it. Let's, let's get together yes. and kick it around because the senior space is huge. Yeah. We could have went there tonight, but for limited time, those are the concepts that we share. Yeah. And so there are a number of people working privately on their own particular ideas. Yeah. But like anything worthwhile and knowable that takes money, investment, yeah, safe investment, calculated investment, Things take a bit of time, and this is, this is new, how do I participate? I'm used to doing it all myself. You mean I have to share power and make decisions with perhaps, how does that work? How do I work alongside? How do I handle conflict? How do I work in a team? That's the next level training that we're going that is, 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 is very new to us as well. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great point though that, that these things aren't going to be formed just online. They're, they're going to require people getting in the same room and talking about ideas, so I, I think that's a great point. I think um, I shared, shared two examples of cooperatives that, um, that we've worked with really recently. One was there was a, a retail store where the owner was just ready to move on and was going to close it down and some very loyal, a small group of very loyal customers uh, decided that they thought, I mean, it, the business was successful, it just, um, it, and, but, but, but the, the one owner was tired of the, the long hours of retail. And so five people came together and spent a lot of time sitting around the dining room table planning how they could buy this business. And then getting to the, to the owner and talking to them about, look, don't close, you know, we heard you're gonna close, don't close, we've got a plan, if you'll share your financial information with us, we can start to build this real plan. And they became a worker cooperative that bought the store um, with a small loan. I think they, they needed about $20,000 to buy it out and do a little bit of uh, some improvements. So really like, you know, really within the reach of, of a reasonable loan. Um, and there was all this history for the business, so it was very easy to, to show this is, a, this is a profitable, good business. And so that was you know, getting together and meeting. Or, or we know a, there's a group that's organizing, a, a, they're, they're trying to build a cooperative grocery store, and it started with probably a, you know, two or three people who had an idea. They took it out to a little bit bigger group, and then it was 10, 12 people who were meeting for a long time. They've now got 1,000 members signed up. Um, you know, growing out from a couple of people with a great idea who sat and kind of sold each other on it to pulling in their friends and family and others who had business experience and knew and, and were committed to it also. Now, a thousand members and they're working on, they just signed the lease for their new store and are raising the money and, you know, so it's, I, I think you're right. It's, it's spending, whichever the scale is, thousand members or five, it's going to be meeting together face to face though. Yeah. Well, yeah. I already commended you, so I didn't, by all means, uh, criticize what you were doing or are doing. Certainly oh, not. No, not at all. I'm just, no, no, not I'm just, at all. I'm just putting a spark out there. Oh, yeah. I, I know, absolutely. I, I really want some interest generated in Bermuda because I'm very passionate about these sort of things. I've got up a radio right now. I'm not going to give anything out tonight, but on another occasion, Mr. Sprig, you're going to hear from me and see me. Absolutely, I've, I've tomorrow. Radio right, I've yeah. done some figures, and the numbers of people that can collectively yeah. come together 
and no name tag of what kind of organization, but it just give you an indication how we can group up in different numbers. It's going to be 20, 30, 40, 2,000 people. I've got all the, the stats. Thank you, Thanks Mr. to my niece, she's a school teacher, and she's uh, prepared this for me, and I hope to yes. circulate very soon. Thank, Thank you okay. so much. Okay. okay, good. So I think we're going to wrap it up there. Yeah, 12 minutes past eight. Thank you all for coming out. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Steve, for staying. Yeah? I'm glad you thought, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah.